Okay. All right, welcome everyone. Um, I'm very happy to introduce um, Dr. Hio uh, Guion today. So Dr. Guion is faculty at uh, Stanford University and she got her PhD from MIT. Um, and actually we were in the same incoming year there. So that's how I know her. Um, she also postdoc at MIT with uh, my, my former mentor, Dr. Rebecca Sachs. And then she moved to Stanford where she's currently faculty She's also director of grad studies of the Symbolic Systems Program and director of the Social Learning Lab. Um, and since then, she went on to receive quite a few um, more and uh, prestigious awards and grants, and she continues to publish at a, at a remarkable rate. And Hio is thoughtful and methodical, and her research is refreshingly interdisciplinary. Um, it combines computational cognitive neuroscience, um, with social psychology, developmental psychology, um, and she's also a wonderful human, and I'm lucky to, to know her. So please join me in welcoming um, Hio. Thanks. Thanks, really, everyone. Uh, it's a really great honor to speak to this audience. Uh, Zainab told me that the audience is primarily people who use neuroimaging methods. Uh, but today's talk uh, might not be your usual talk because a lot of the studies uh, I'm going to talk about are not necessarily using neuroimaging methods. In fact, a lot of them will be studies with children. But there's a reason why uh, I'm really excited to speak to this audience. Uh, and I hope I can speak both to neuroimaging uh, folks as well as people who primarily do developmental work. Uh, and hopefully the reason will become a little bit more clear towards the end. Um, so let me just start the talk with, a. Uh, let me, sorry, my face somehow got super huge on the screen. So I'm just going to switch to gallery view and so that I don't see myself uh, and uh, so that I can see you all during my uh, talk. So let me just start by saying something that's pretty obvious. Uh, we learn from other people. Uh, all of you here may have your own, own ideas of what learning means, but at least for humans, learning almost nearly never happens in total isolation, and that's especially true in early childhood. So as a species, humans have evolved with other people, uh, and we have evolved to be with other people and to be uh, to learn from other people. So we've lived and survived through uh, cooperating with others and competing with others, as you see here, and also throughout the history, we've been developing better ways to communicate with others. Uh, perhaps for better or for worse. Uh, and then now we're communicating with others via Zoom. And these kinds of social demands have shaped our brains and shaped our minds. And as individuals, not just as a species, uh, as soon as we're born, we're surrounded by other people uh, and we observe their actions, we observe their behaviors, we track them, we learn from them, we think about what's in their minds. And humans have been, even created cultural institutions to promote and facilitate social learning in various ways from the way that we raise our children and how we scale that process up to develop schools like you see here and educational systems. And we're actually all uh, a, a part of a, an institution we call university where the whole purpose is to try to uh, learn about the world, share that with other people and learn from other people as well. So it's obvious uh, that we learn from others, uh, but the question is how we do that. Uh, and that's the driving question that, uh, uh, that uh, really guides our research. The question is, what makes human social learning so distinctive, powerful, and smart? And how does the brain support such kind of learning? And I'm asking this question because many non-human species uh, learn from others in various ways. Humans are not the only species that engages in social learning. So if uh, not to mention chimpanzees or meerkats, there are stars of the social learning world. There's crows, uh, there's bumblebees, there is even uh, fish or ants uh, that seem to be uh, influencing others' behaviors and are influenced by others' behaviors in various ways. And also uh, humans 
learn from others seemingly in similar ways. You're familiar with young children and infants imitating others' actions. And sometimes children imitate others' actions to a kind of an absurd degree that this person just showed this child how to open this box, emphasizing that some of the actions are completely unnecessary. But when left alone, uh, the child would copy even the unnecessary actions. So this is a phenomenon that we call overimage. Imitation. And imitation, again, is something that is pretty big in the AI world. There is machines that are in algorithms that are being developed with the primary goal of perceiving others' actions and reproducing them such that uh, they can learn in a better way. But the question is, is this really the, only, the, the end of the story, that we learn from others by copying others' actions and following what we're told to do? So let me just play a clip of uh, a three-year-old. Uh, this is from uh, a long, uh, an experiment that I uh, did as a graduate student. This is uh, a study that never got published because we couldn't make anything out of the findings, but I got a really good clip out of it. So I'll just uh, play it and here it goes. Whoa. See this? This is my it's former it's RA. It's 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 See that? She showed right. this uh, to play with, uh, right, a block so that not, sticks okay. to the, uh, the panel here. She tries for a while, but none of the blocks she got actually stick to the, the board. So she tries them no, one by one. They're still not sticking. How do these stick? Just let me know when you're done playing. So what you've seen here in just about a minute, she does a bunch of things, uh, even in this short clip, she observes other people's actions. Uh, she does imitate and she, she does the same thing. She tries the same thing, but uh, she generalizes the, what she's seen to other blankets or other functions and she, she tries all of them. And turns out uh, none of them stick. So she will try to explore all the other blocks and just to see if there's anything that sticks. Uh, she's trying to explain what's going on. Uh, and she wonders whether there's the st sticking mechanism is not in there. And she uh, communicates her thoughts as she's exploring and as she's interacting with uh, her environment. And she actually uh, even optimizes. She decides that she's not going to do it anymore. And she's going to build a tower and her brother's going to help her. So. There's a lot of things happening in there. And the question that I'm going to start is, let's zoom back or let's zoom out a little bit. Let's step back a little bit and really think about, rather than thinking just about social learning, uh, how do we learn from others? Let's start by asking, how do people learn in general? So here's uh, a learner. And the learner may have a few things in front of them. There is maybe a couple of toys, a uh, part of the physical world. And the learner might be thinking, well, how does the world work? So the ways in which people have studied learning in general is to see how learners think about uh, the evidence by generating, exploring, exploring and generating evidence and learning from them. So for instance, a baby here might be pressing this button on a toy and learns that uh, the toy makes music. Or uh, this child may explore this toy and learns that if you pull out this tube uh, from one part of the toy, the toy makes a squeak sound. So the, the, for the past couple of decades, we have learned uh, from a lot of research in developmental science and cognitive science more generally, that humans have an intuitive internal model of the world. And uh, people draw, and especially even children too, reach abstract, uh, we have rich abstract causal representations of how the world works. We uh, draw inferences from the data that we generate. And the evidence often comes from uh, the ex active exploration and hypothesis testing behaviors. And a lot of the work uh, I've also done is to show that these abilities are present early in life. Stahl and Feigenson recently have also done really beautiful work uh, on infants' exploration upon uh, violation of physical principles. 
So you may be familiar with the idea that children are like scientists, they think like scientists, they try to gather evidence, they reason from the evidence to learn about the world. Uh, and this active, curious picture of young children as scientists stands as a pretty striking contrast to the image of young children as social learners. Well, what about children as social learner? We tend to think of them as passive recipients of information. They copy what other, other people do. They receive information from others and they will trust other people. So the picture is much more passive or deferential or even credulous. So the, but if you think about what's happening in a lot of the studies that have been uh, hailed as showing children as scientists, actually, a lot of the evidence in most cases are presented by other people. So there's people here who are showing some uh, demonstrations of evidence, putting uh, blicket detectors on blicket machines to uh, study causal reasoning. And the child might also see other people presenting some information about the these toys. So the question is, uh, how do we think about the role of these people who are interacting with them, interacting with the objects such that the uh, learners can observe what they're doing? So I'm going back to the statement that I said in the beginning that learning does not occur in isolation. Often, the most useful data for learning come from others' interaction with the world. Uh, and sometimes these actions may be just incidental without a clear goal and the learner just happens to observe them. Sometimes these are instrumental actions without any regard to the learner, but just for the person who's doing something for their uh, self-serving goal. But sometimes actions are communicative, they have an instructional purpose with a pedagogical goal, and especially learning in these contexts can be very powerful if the learner is capable of capitalizing on that property of information. So the, the idea that I've been trying to put forward uh, is that learners inter is, are not just passively absorbing evidence. They're not or, or just copying the superficial aspects of the action, but learners are interpreting the meaning of the evidence that's generated by other people based on an understanding of who generated the evidence and why they did so. So, and this requires an intuitive theory of not just how the world works, not just about the causal uh, systems in the world, but also an intuitive theory of other minds, how other people think, uh, how other people plan and act. Uh, so this is uh, how I've been trying to uh, sort of deliver the message that social learning is more than just imitation, but it's, uh, we can think of it as inference from evidence generated by other people. So that was kind of a long sort of introduction to uh, the, the general idea uh, that I, we've been pushing forward as a lab. Uh, but for today's agenda, uh, what I'm going to do in the first part is, well, well, what are the evidence for us to think that social learning is inferential indeed? Uh, so there are some of the empirical support that I like to present to you. Uh, some parts are about children as learners and other parts are as children as learners. The learner part, I'll just do a quick summary. Uh, teachers, I'll just uh, present one case study to demonstrate uh, the point. The second part is how we can extend the scope of this picture to explain things that are not necessarily teacher-learner interactions. So I'll show you a little bit of uh, some of the studies we've been working on, uh, on how this extends to learning about people and learning about the self or communicating about the self, as well as the scope of information for social learning and how that extends uh, beyond just words and demonstrations, but also uh, allowing us to learn from others' emotional expressions. And in part three, uh, I will show you uh, a study that is part of our attempts to try to leverage computational and neuroimaging methods to really understand how our minds are capable of engaging in this inferential social learning. Okay, just to get to part one, uh, I'll just do a quick summary, as I said, uh, because this is all published work from uh, uh, that are relatively older. But one of the ways in which uh, we have shown that children are doing more than uh, just imitating others' action is showing how infants can use statistical evidence that's embedded in others' behaviors to infer why they failed. So here's a child uh, who just saw uh, a person activating this toy, and she's trying now 
know, but she can't make it happen. So she may imitate the action, but she's failing. So what should the child do? And what uh, we have shown earlier uh, in, in this study is that children are paying attention to the statistical evidence that's correlation information that's embedded in other people's actions. And they can <clears throat> try a different toy or ask somebody else uh, to show them how the toy works, depending on the pattern of co uh, covariation evidence. So for instance, <clears throat> if there's two people in front of this child uh, taking turns to activate the toy, uh, children see two different kinds of evidence depending on the condition. Uh, one in the top condition within agents, one person can activate the toy, but fails the next time, the other person, uh, same thing happens. So one pers uh, each person fails once and uh, succeeds once. Uh, in, the, in the other condition, the actual evidence is pretty much the same. Uh, the people fail twice, the ch children see the toy activating twice and not activating twice, but one person was able to make the toy go both times, whereas the other person wasn't able to make the toy go both times. So this kind of evidence makes children interpret their own failures in different ways. For instance, if I'm in the bottom condition between agent's condition, uh, I try the toy, I can't make it work. Well, it turns out some people were able to make it go. Other people uh, weren't, weren't able to make it go. So perhaps uh, it is me who's causing the failure and I might as well try ask another person because the cause is me that's, um, that's leading me to fail uh, to activate the toy. Oops, I'm getting, okay. I got a notifica uh, notification that my internet connection is stable. If I'm freezing up, just let me know. Um, however, uh, so what we have shown in this study is that children do different things. Given the failures, they will always try to imitate and try a few different, uh, try I mean, multiple times, but what they do afterwards depends on what they have seen earlier. Depending on the statistical evidence, they either try to change the object, which means they will try to try a different toy uh, or try to change the agent, which means they will ask a person to help them activate the toy. So another way in which we've shown something, uh, a similar uh, phenomenon is by showing that given this child, uh, this, so this child uh, is trying to figure out whether the yellow toy squeaks too, given that the child just watched three blue toys uh, making a squeak sound if the person squeezes the toy in front of them. Uh, what we have shown is that Get this, even though children always see three blue toys that are squeaky and are now given a new yellow toy, so children have no idea what this might do, children have different, make different inferences depending on how the blue toys were sampled. So if I've pulled out the three blue toys from a box that looks like this. Uh, so the box has mostly blue toys and just a few yellow ones. Uh, then the sample of three blue toys strongly imply uh, that these might have been just randomly sampled. Uh, however, if it comes from a box that's mostly yellow, then it strongly suggests that I selectively pulled out these three toys from the box, presumably because the yellow toy uh, does not squeak. So uh, what we have shown is that when uh, the box is mostly yellow, like the one you see on the right, uh, then children uh, infer that this yellow toy presumably doesn't squeak, even though they've never seen a person demonstrate the yellow toy before. A similar inference uh, can happen uh, when children are uh, when children are exploring toys, but these inferences are especially powerful when the lear learner understands that the teacher is generating evidence for the purpose of teaching them. So, what we have shown in this study is that. There is a complex looking toy that ch child might be think uh, thinking uh, whether to explore, exploit or whether to explore. Uh, what has happened just before is that children lear uh, learned that the toy has one function and they learned it through observing a person uh, acting on the toy. But in, in the case where the person said, hey, this, this is my toy <clears throat> and let me show you how, <clears throat> excuse me, let me show you how the toy works and pedagogically demonstrate this toy, then 
the children make the inference that, well, she didn't show me other functions. And she just said that she knows all of the toy. So this must be the only function. Them. And what children do is to exploit <clears throat> this information and not explore the toy as much. Whereas if the similar action is shown from by a person who claims to not know anything about the toy and she just ac accidentally discovers the function, uh, then what children do is to explore the toy much more broadly. And finally, uh, if the child infers from this kind of demonstration that, well, the toy only has one function, so I'm going to go ahead and just play with it and exploit this uh, knowledge, children, if children discover, actually, in the course of their uh, exploration, then what this suggests is that uh, the toy, uh, the teacher was actually unhelpful. The teacher could have shown uh, other functions, but she did not. And therefore, children draw inferences about the helpfulness of the teacher, and they can evaluate other people accordingly. So what this means is that even though a lot of the uh, prior work on children's evaluations of teachers really based uh, depended on uh, or really manipulated others' accuracy. Do children uh, follow teachers who are accurate uh, and more than they follow inaccurate teachers? What this study has shown is that they're going above and beyond just tracking accuracy to reason about what other per people could have shown them. And if they didn't show enough, even though the information is accurate, they will evaluate the teacher as unhelpful. So I'm happy to answer any questions about these studies. I went through relatively quickly, uh, but the point is that uh, through these studies, what we have shown is that children's learning from others is far more than imitating others' actions. They do imitate, uh, they will follow what other people do, uh, but what they're doing on top of that is to draw inferences based on their understanding of how other, uh, the evidence was generated and draw inferences based on who did what and why. But this is only half of the story, uh, because if children are able to understand what it means to be a helpful teacher, and if they can evaluate teachers who don't provide enough information, then they ought to be also able to act as helpful teachers themselves. That is, uh, uh, if they know something about the world. So uh, the other half uh, of this picture is something that we've been trying to fill in for the last few years. Are children capable of uh, generating useful evidence uh, for other people by considering what is most helpful for the learner? So for instance, uh, imagine you're uh, cast away on a remote island and you tried really, really hard to uh, discover how to make fire. Now, if you see another, you, you might be really, really happy that you did so, but if you see another learner, also, uh, another person also stranded on the same island, you may be able to also see that this person is going to struggle for a while to learn how to make fire on their own. And you may be uh, feeling like, oh, you may want to teach this person how to make uh, fire. So the intuition we're trying to test here is, well, do children understand what information can maximize the learner's utility, not their own, but other people? And can they uh, uh, present information that saves others trouble, that is uh, information that decreases other people's costs, and information that benefits others, that is information that increases rewards? So this is joint work by my former student, Sophie Bridgers, who is now a postdoc at MIT, and Julian Hara Ettinger, uh, who is an assistant professor at Yale. So in this study, uh, what we have done is to create uh, some toys. So this toy is pretty simple. Uh, if you press this button on top, it makes music. And uh, the music was relatively not super exciting. Uh, this is what we call the low reward, uh, low cost toy. So it's uh, not as costly to activate and it also generates reward that is not uh, as exciting as this other toy, which we call the high, uh, high reward, high cost toy. The way that this toy works is that you have to press exactly those two buttons at the same time uh, to make this light globe spin. So this is super exciting for children. Uh, they love it. 
but it's almost impossible for them to uh, discover on their own how the toy works because you really have to press exactly those two. So what we have done is to present the pair of uh, both, uh, both toys to children and we allow them to play and demonstrate to make sure that they understood how to make the toy go. Uh, and because especially the high reward toy is really hard to discover, we uh, do a guided play in order to make sure children try it for a while and they finally uh, get the experience of having discovered the toy. And the question is, well, which one to teach to a different person? So the experimenter has a friend who's going to play with these toys all by herself. And the question is, which toy should I teach my child? Uh, should I teach my friend? So this is a decision to teach one of them and letting the learner explore the other toy. So let me uh, give you a quick sense of how we try to uh, model the predictions for these sets of studies. So here the pair is low reward, low cost and high reward, high cost toys. So, there is, so we uh, formalize this as a decision to teach one of the toys and uh, letting the uh, learner explore the other one. And imagine that the, uh, uh, the so the, and it's a comparison between two potential teaching plans. One is to teach the top one, let the learner discover the uh, lower one. Uh, and this, uh, this in, in this kind of formulation, what happens is that by teaching the top toy, the learner definitely uh, can activate the chosen toy and she, uh, the learner would get the reward out of it. Uh, and, with, uh, and the learner has to uh, explore and discover how the bottom toy works. And because the cost is really high, uh, there's a good chance that the learner may never discover how the toy works. However, if you choose to teach the bottom one, uh, what we call Y here, and let the learner discover the top toy, then the learner would definitely discover or be able to reap the reward from the bottom toy, uh, while also being pretty likely to reap the reward from the uh, top toy too, because that one is really easy to discover. So in this case, it's uh, better to choose the one at the bottom because that's the one that's really hard to discover on their own. And it's something that you may want to prioritize teaching. But we didn't stop here. We generate a, a number of conditions with different pairings of different toys that differed in their relative cost and rewards. Uh, so in this condition, we uh, pitted low reward, low cost toy against a low reward, high cost toy, just varying the cost, uh, making rewards the same. And in the rest of the conditions compared the high reward, low cost toy to a few different toys, uh, but raising the cost uh, uh, one by one. So this is a low reward, low cost toy, a medium cost toy, and high cost toy, and very high cost toy. So we should see increasing impact of this increasing cost uh, in the model predictions. So this is what the model predicts. Um, so the in the first pair, as I explained, uh, it's better to teach the, the bottom one. So that's the proportion of the yellow uh, yellow bar as opposed to the red bar. Uh, same, uh, similar choice when the costs are different, but the reward is the same. And what you see as the cost increase is that the model increasingly chooses the one with higher, uh, uh, chooses the bottom toy, which means the model is capable of considering the increasing cost and prioritizes the toy more. What I'm going to show you is uh, children's uh, actual data that we collected from children uh, by asking children to choose between the two toys. And this is what we see from children's uh, choices. Uh, and what we have shown is that this is the full model. So just going to flip back and forth the model predictions and children's uh, responses uh, to show the correspondence here. And what we have shown is that in order to make the correct predictions to, uh, about children's choices, it is really important to consider not just the rewards, but also the costs, and not just the top toy, but also the toy to be discovered. So you need to consider all of these uh, uh, variables in order to correctly predict children's behaviors, which allows us to infer that uh, children are also doing this kind of calculation. They are considering the learner's cost and rewards 
uh, of not just uh, being taught, but also exploring on their own and making decisions accordingly. So uh, what this implies is that, well, learners uh, are, a lot of the studies we've learned from uh, developmental research is that children are really great at discovering and exploring, but learners can discover only so much and teachers cannot teach everything. So we need smart priorita prioritization of what needs to be taught. And this kind of utility-based reasoning can be a basis for curation of useful knowledge over generations if you extend this kind of reasoning for how cultural knowledge might be transmitted. And what we have shown here is that young children consider other people's expected utilities of learning from exploration and learning from others. And they can decide which one to teach and which one to let others explore. And this requires reasoning, not just about others' mental states, but also about their utilities, that is costs and rewards. So now let me tell you a little bit about how this kind of thinking, uh, social learning as inference and social teaching as communication of information may be able to extend, it may be, ex be extended to apply, uh, explain different kinds of phenomena. So let me just show you a video uh, before explaining the study uh, to make the point. Let's see. So this is what we call uh, an absent condition. So, so Ethan, we're gonna play with these toys today. And sometimes my friend Anne will watch you play. Does that sound okay? Yes. Okay. And you know what? I think Anne's ready to watch us play now. Hey Anne, is that you? Hi. Hi Anne. So Ethan and I were just about to play with these toys here. Oh, cool. Wow, these toys are really cool. I've never seen these toys before. I don't know anything about them. I have seen these. You've never seen them either. Okay, so you know what, Ethan? I think we're going to play with this toy first, okay? Okay, I knew it because my favorite color is red. Cause your favorite the child color has never red? seen the okay. toy before, but he can't right. see that. see what this toy can do? Okay. One, two, three, go. Make noise. Wow, that's really cool. A toy makes music. Okay, now you can try. One, two, three, go. So here's an experimenter hmm. able to, uh, being able to activate okay, this toy. The child okay. cannot make it go. And here's three, another observer one. named Anne who's watching him and saying, oh. Where's the green one? She oh, says it's really, really cool. cool. It makes music. Okay, now you can try, Ethan. One, two, three. I'll try. It doesn't work. Hmm. Okay. So you know what, Ethan? What? You have to push this button and this button at the exact same time. Okay? Oh yeah. I forgot. You forgot. Cool. <laughs> well, I have to run. Okay, bye. See you later. So Anne leaves the room after seeing the child fail twice. Can I try again? Yeah. Okay. One last time. One, two, three. Oh, there you go. Oh, yeah. And the child finally. <laughs> So what this this is this condition is called the absent condition because the person was absent during the final success. So in this study, children uh, uh, were observed as they tried uh, this toy a couple of times. The child fails twice in both conditions uh, in the presence of this person, Anne, uh, who recognizes the child's failure. And then in this condition, Anne left the room uh, after before the child succeeds. Um, so she leaves the room thinking that the child cannot activate the toy. And then uh, you might have seen the other toy, the green toy that, uh, that the child also fails twice and then succeeds, but Anne wasn't present for, in the room the entire time. And then what they are given uh, is a choice between the two, uh, to, uh, two toys. Uh, we're going to be asking them, hey, Anne is going to come back to the room. Which toy do you want to show her? So if they really understand that the, this person saw them fail twice uh, and they really want to correct the person's belief, they would be choosing uh, the red toy here. But in the present condition, if 
Um, the only difference was that Anne left after seeing the child succeed. So in this case, children have no clear reason to uh, act, uh, show the red toy to the person. And if anything, they should be trying to show the green toy because she was absent in the room the entire time. Uh, so the key difference, it was Anne's belief uh, at the time of leaving the room, either thinking that the child cannot activate the toy or leaving the room thinking that the child can activate the red toy. So in this condition, uh, uh, so in both conditions, children had strong reasons to communicate that green toy because she was not in the room at all. Uh, she's never seen the toy before. So there's all the reasons to try to show the green toy to communicate how this toy works. So that's exactly what children do in the present condition uh, when they didn't have a reason to show the red toy. However, in the absent condition, children are more likely to show the red toy to the person, suggesting that they may be considering uh, what the person might be thinking of their ability. However, uh, in this condition, children are kind of split half and half, uh, meaning that they could be a chance because they were just confused. So what we have done in a different condition is to make sure that Anne knows how uh, both of the toys work. So we are removing the communicative goal to teach them person uh, and only leaving the goal to show off, hey, you think I can't make this red toy go, let me show it to you. So when we run that condition, what we see is a stronger uh, pattern of uh, preference for the red toy, suggesting that children may be having a a few different communicative goals here. They can try to inform the other person about something that other people don't know, or they may be trying to communicate something about the self uh, because they're capable of representing what other people may think about them, given their observations of their own failures. So children are great teachers and we've done some work in the past and the study that I just showed you on their consideration of utilities, they are capable, capable of being good teachers and generating good evidence for other people, but they're more than just teachers because they can also infer what Anne thinks about the self, they, can, they care about what she thinks, and they want to correct or revise what Anne thinks about themselves, and they will communicate to manage what other people think of them. What I will do is to just given the, uh, in the interest of time, uh, one of the studies I uh, was hoping to show you after this is how, well, in this study, children were able to know exactly what they're capable of doing and not doing. But oftentimes they don't know and they have to rely on other people's uh, praise or criticisms or feedback to learn about the self. So some of the work that we've done in, the, in this uh, line uh, in this line of thinking is to show that children are also able to infer the informativeness of other people's praise, depending on whether they were over praisers or selective praisers, and they will uh, weight information from selective praiser more when they have to decide uh, when, uh, when, which one of their two drawings are better. Uh, but I will skip that for the purpose of, uh, uh, in, in the interest of time, but just to emphasize uh, uh, what we have learned from just this past study I've shown you, children are curious about how well they did and what other people think of them. And they can use uh, data or others' observations to consider, uh, consider what other people might think of them, and they will try to change what others uh, think of them too. And yeah, and, and even though I wasn't able to uh, tell you about this study in the interest of time, uh, they can even evaluate other people based on their informativeness and what uh, they will try to selectively follow other people's uh, or uh, consider other people's praise depending on whether they were informative, they were providing informative feedback or not as informative feedback. But just to step back a little bit again, uh, the all of the studies I've shown you so far have considered uh, people's actions, their behaviors, uh, their verbal uh, behaviors, as well as goal-based, uh, uh, goal-directed action demonstrations as information. 
And children also get similar evidence from exploration too. They act on the world and they observe informative evidence based on their exploration too. Uh, and actually uh, when they see or when they receive evidence from their exploration that is surprising or uh, violating their predictions, uh, many studies have shown that surprising events can lead to further exploration uh, because prediction er error provides a signal for learning. However, imagine the situation where there's a learner and a person in front of the learner, uh, and there's a part of the world that the learner cannot see, but the teacher, the screen person can see it, and this person says, oh, wow. Then from that emotional expressions, uh, the learner might be able to use that information to infer what's behind. So what's over there? What did she see? And what might have led the person to have that prediction error? So the idea that we uh, have been developing in the lab uh, with uh, postdoc Yang Wu is that, uh, is that children may be able to infer hidden states of the world by using other people's surprise as vicarious prediction error. So let me show you uh, some of the studies we've done in this space. Uh, for instance, uh, so in this study, uh, ch what children see is this toy uh, and they just uh, explore this toy with another experimenter to see, uh, to understand that there's a huge button on top. If you press this button, the toy plays, uh, the, the toy lights up. Let's see what happens here. Hey, Taylor. Do you remember that we have some paperwork today today? Oh, you're right. I'm sorry, I forgot. Well, maybe I can finish up playing with this toy and then I can help you with paperwork over there. Does that sound okay? Yes. Okay. All right. I think I really like this toy. I really like playing with it. <gasps> That's so cool. Would you like to turn to play? Okay. When you're doing paperwork over there, you let me know when you're done playing, okay? The child tries the top of me. The child also tries many other parts of the toy. What was so cool? The child asks, what was so cool? So what happened in this study? Uh, what we have manipulated across both conditions is uh, whether or not uh, the person who expressed surprise uh, had the same kind of knowledge with the child. So what you have seen is what we call the common ground condition. Uh, this experimenter just played uh, with the child and they both discovered this top button that makes a really so cool effect. And then she went ahead and explored the toy uh, without the child being able to see what she's doing. And then she was saying, oh, that's so cool, which immediately makes the child to infer or there must be some other causal function that I have seen before. So when they're left alone to explore the toy, we expected that they will be trying to explore the toy really broadly to try to discover what that function might be. Uh, in the no common ground condition, everything was the same except that uh, the person who knocked on the door in the beginning of the video, she uh, took the place of the experimenter and she expressed the surprise in the same way. Um, so in this person did not know anything about the toy such that it was possible that what she discovered was actually what the child already knows. So we manipulated the common ground knowledge between the person who expressed surprise and the children themselves. So the inference children might be making in the common ground condition is that there must be something else. Uh, but in the other case, what, what should children might be thinking is that she must have maybe seen these lights because this one's really easy to discover. It's the first thing that anybody might uh, try with the toy. So uh, consistent with uh, these predictions, what children have done is spending a lot more time exploring the toy rather than explo exploiting the known causal function if the surprise was expressed by somebody who shares the common ground with them. Uh, but given the same surprise, when it comes from somebody who doesn't know the same thing as them, then they interpret the same surprise differently. It's not a prediction error to them, it's a prediction error for that person, presumably because she already found the function that uh, uh, children themselves know about.
Uh, another way in which we've been trying to show uh, this kind of reasoning is by doing uh, a study with infants. So for instance, if I'm uh, closing my eyes and uh, grabbing a, a, a ball from this kind of box, uh, you would think that there would there is likely a, a, red to a red ball in the box rather than the white one. So the red ball is the expected outcome, the white one is the unexpected outcome. And we have replicated this finding uh, in the lab. Uh, this is a well-known finding from Beiju and others. But what we have done is to uh, include something right before we reveal what's in the box. So uh, this experimenter grabs the toy from the box, uh, uh, grabs a ball from the box. But before she uh, reveals it to the babies, she peeks at the content of the box. Uh, she places the ball inside this little black box. She peeks, the, peeks at the outcome and she expresses surprise. Now, what this surprise does to the baby is to actually flip the predictions about what she must have gotten. Because if she's surprised, it means that, uh, well, the, she must have gotten the unexpected outcome. So given surprise, the expected outcome becomes now unexpected. The unexpected outcome now becomes expected. And so what we have shown uh, across a set of studies is that children are looking longer at the, uh, the high probability outcome when there is a prize, but it flips in the other direction, uh, just like what we have seen in previous studies when the emotion, uh, emotion expression is not surprise, but something that doesn't necessarily indicate a sub, um, prediction error. And we have replicated this finding with a much larger number of infants uh, to uh, really try to show that what infants are doing is using others' emotion expressions, especially expressions of surprise, as vicarious prediction error. And they're able to revise their expectations about the content, in the content of the box given uh, other people's emotion expressions. So what I have done so far is to give you a brief overview of what I mean by social learning as inferential at its core and some of the empirical support uh, from children as learners and children as teachers and how this kind of uh, reasoning from evidence generated by other people can be extended to explain how we learn from, about other people, how we communicate about the self, and how we might also use others' emotion expressions to learn from other people. Now, the third part is uh, uh, some thoughts on how we can leverage computation and neuroimaging methods to understand how other minds work, uh, how our minds engage in inferential social learning. So one key goal of cognitive neuroscience is to understand how cognition is implemented in the brain. Uh, we can use neuroimaging methods or other measures that uh, measure activities in the brain uh, to inform or test and tease apart theories of cognition. And one of the things is, uh, uh, and one, one key idea is that it helps to have competing hypotheses that are formalized as computational models, uh, just like how we can learn more from children's behaviors by going beyond asking whether or not children do something, but using computational models to guide our predictions, uh, we can also better answer how the brain is performing these computations by having model predictions uh, not just against behavioral data, but to have model-guided uh, uh, model uh, predictions about fMRI data. So some of the work we've done in this space uh, is uh, by, led by Natalia Velez. Some of you might know her as the science sketcher. Uh, she's uh, well known on the Twitter world, but she also will be starting as an assistant professor at Princeton starting in 2023. Uh, so those of you uh, uh, who might be interested in working with her, uh, this is a great person who's starting a lab soon. But one of the studies we've done in this space this is uh, by asking uh, how people might use others' advice to make better decisions and applying uh, the paradigm to an fMRI study. So let's say you drew a card from a deck of six cards. Oh, whoops, that's, uh, well, let's say eight cards, one to eight. And, uh, and you have a choice uh, and you choose, a, uh, you choose a, a card like this and the other person chooses a card like this. 
Now you have a decision to stay with your card or switch to the other person's card, but you don't know which uh, card the other person has. Would you stay or would you switch? The goal is to get as many points as possible. Raise your hand if you would like to switch. I see many hands here, great. Uh, so you made a pretty reasonable decision. Uh, if you have a six, would you rather stay or switch? Raise your hand if you would switch. Cool. Well, what if this person says, well, I recommend that you switch, but this person can't see your card. This person only has uh, access to their own card. Would you switch? Not sure. Yep, sort of unsure. So what children, uh, well, not, not children, I've talked too, many, too much about children, but human adults uh, benefit from advice of people who know just as much as they do. So in this case, I know half of the world, you know the other half of the world, and I have to make a bit decision based on your recommendation. But because the person also knows only half of the world, their uh, advice, while well-intended, may not always be the right choice. So, uh, so what people do in this case is to be a uh, uh, following their own response functions, but also be influenced by the advisor's um, advice. Now there's two ways of benefiting from others' advice. We can have two different theories about how people might be doing this. One strategy is to follow, uh, just completely track past accuracy of people and weight your uh, trust in the person's advice based on the past accuracy. So for instance, if the left is your response function uh, and the uh, advisor has been accurate 75 times, 75% of the times in the past, then you can do a weighted average of the two uh, to decide what to do from this person's advice. A different strategy is to draw inferences about the card value that the other person might have by reasoning about the advisor's choice function and uh, use that as a way to infer the uh, card value. And in both, uh, in the simple case, um, what these two models is to uh, generate the predictions that look like this, which actually looks like uh, much like the human data. So if you just have the simple manipulation of a person providing uh, advice, then it's, it, it's, it's not easy to tease the two models apart. However, what we can do is to create a scenario where two advisors are equally accurate, but differ in their strategy. So we created two different cases of advisors. One is a conservative advisor who is not going to suggest you switch until they have a pretty high card number uh, versus a risky advisor who advises you to switch, uh, even though you only have a little bit of chance of being right. So if you uh, compare the two, if you generate model predictions uh, uh, based on these two strategies, because the accuracy model only cares about the past accuracy and these two advisors are equally accurate actually, uh, the model doesn't distinguish between the conservative versus risky advisor. However, the model that considers the, uh, that tries to infer the advisor's choice function and generate predictions about the hidden card value and makes a choice, uh, uh, makes predictions that uh, differentiate between the two advisors. So what do human, uh, human participants do uh, when, they, uh, uh, when they have either the conservative or the risk advisor? Uh, the human data look like this. Uh, and if you look at the correlation between the human data and the model predictions, uh, the model predictions from the inferential uh, model does much better than the model that just simply tracks past accuracy. So tracking others' accuracy isn't enough. We're also able to infer the contents of other people's minds. And what we have tried to do uh, is to run the same study uh, in the scanner uh, by asking people to make choices based on the advisor's advice. Uh, and what we have done is to um, have two predictions. One is by using the expected value of the hidden card as a regressor to ask whether there's brain regions that are tracking the value of the choice options that are not directly observed, but inferred through advice. 
And another uh, approach is to use multivoxel pattern analysis to ask whether regions within the theory of my network, for instance, do these regions contain abstract representations of the advisor's knowledge? So in order to do this, we have run the study across three conditions. Uh, the one that I've explained so far is what we call the hidden condition, because the learner has to infer the value of the hidden card. But in other two conditions, the advisor could see both cards and always uh, um, recommended the correct option. In the other case, the uh, advisor would, was able to see none of the cards and generated evidence randomly. So the advisor's advice was always useful in both, uh, not at all useful in the non-condition and somewhat useful in the hidden condition. And in the hidden condition, the learner had to work in order to make that evidence useful. Uh, what we have seen it, here is that uh, if you look at the expected value, if you look at the brain regions, or if you look at the voxels that are active, uh, when if you use the regressor of the expected value of the hidden card uh, and look at the regions that show a higher activity for the hidden condition compared to the other two conditions, what we see is uh, activities in the IPS as well as IFG, uh, precunius, and ACC. And we're especially interested in the findings in the IPS where uh, this region is involved in representation of numerical values, where it might also be able to tell us something about what the other person, uh, what people are representing about a number that is inside another person's mind. And uh, we have done a multivoxel pattern analysis uh, to identify two regions within the theory of my network. Precunius and VMPFC seems to contain information that distinguishes between advisors' epistemic states. And uh, I'm happy to explain this a little bit more later in the Q&A, uh, but the confusion matrix uh, suggests that the precunius may be able to distinguish all three conditions of the advisor's epistemic state, knowing none of the cards, both of the cards, Cards, only one of the cards, but VMPFC seems to lump together the hidden and both, which are the cases where the advisor's advice is relevant to their choices, but not a, not uh, but dis but distinguishing the two from from the non condition where the evidence is not useful at all. But this study. Uh, is really just the first steps uh, because inferences in social context are difficult to induce in the scanner uh, and repeating many trials leads to heuristics and scanning children still remains an expensive endeavor to try to understand how these inferences might be implemented in the developing brain. And uh, some of the uh, thoughts that we have about what social neuroscience can do better to really understand the process by which we draw inferences about other people's minds and learn from the evidence they provide uh, is uh, summarized in the recent paper that actually just got published last week uh, um, that we have written together. Um, so I'm happy to refer to you to uh, these papers as well. Uh, but Overall, uh, what I try to show, I'm going to skip over this slide uh, just to give you the, uh, the last bits. So what I have hopefully done so far is to give you the idea or present the idea that social learning and teaching can be studied as inferences for interpreting and generating the evidence. Uh, and this requires both parties to reason about other minds. And it's not enough to just think about what others know or want, that is mental states, but it's also critical to consider others' utilities. I've also shown you a couple of ways in which this picture can be extended, how we might be using it to reason about others and learn about others, communicate about the self, and how information in this context is not just about words or actions, but also emotion, uh, emotional expressions. And towards the end, I told you a little bit about how we can leverage the interdisciplinary ideas and methods, not just using developmental methods to identify remarkably sophisticated inferences that young children can make, but also how we can formalize these theories and test them against behavioral and neuroimaging data. So uh, the, these kinds of interdisciplinary, is, interdisciplinary approaches is something that uh, I've been uh, really trying to implement in my own work and also uh, 
encourage other people to uh, implement as well. I'm sorry I didn't get to talk to students, but this is something I would have loved to talk to students more about the importance of uh, using interdisciplinary ideas and using it to advance your own research. But one use is that Natalia Velez, who is really one of the uh, folks who are really trying to com combine these methods together, is to going to give a talk in two weeks, I believe. So I hope a lot of students can get a chance to talk with her as well. So I think I went a little, um, maybe a lot over time. Uh, uh, but thank you for listening. Thank you for staying. And uh, I'll, I'm happy to take questions uh, for those who can stay. Thanks so much, Yo. Wonderful talk. Um, so we have uh, maybe one or two minutes for questions from students. Let's start with, if there are any. Okay. Well, um, I'll I have a question. So I'm wondering about um, uh, how a child learner decides whether or not someone is a teacher. Right. So what are sort of the decisions that you think are going on? Um, yeah. I need to test that. Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, I think there's a few uh, theories out there. I think natural pedagogy theory, for instance, this is uh, Gergé Chibra and others uh, uh, have been like doing a lot of remarkable studies on how ostensive cues, a specific behavioral markers like pointing and hand waving, child directed speech, these kinds of cues are really making even very young infants make different inferences from the data. They are preparing themselves for the upcoming information that is coming from teachers. So I think there's a, uh, the, the role of these cues are really interesting. Uh, but there's a difference between assuming that we have an innate mechanism for detecting these cues and automatically being prepared to interpret information in the presence of these cues, as opposed to, I'm considering this cue as evidence that you know something about the world and the fact that you're trying to teach me. So that can be a cue for inferring the intentions of the person and the prior knowledge of the person. And therefore you are interpreting whatever the person's doing afterwards as something that's coming from a teacher. So whether, uh, so a lot, there's other things that may serve as cues that it's telling children that this person is a teacher, one might as well just say, I'm a teacher, I'm gonna show you everything. And this is some of the manipulations we've done in some of the studies too. And maybe there's a reason why we have schools and classroom environments to really tell the student that you know, the context is screaming out, you're a student, you're going to be learning something useful from teachers. However, what's been useful to uh, uh, the, the ways in which these developmental studies have shown, and still this remains a question, is whether we are detecting cues and these cues are triggering your responses to interpret certain information as generalizable or something that you learn from teachers, as opposed to you're using these behaviors to infer the intentions of a person, reasoning about the person's mind in order to interpret the evidence differently. So I think these are still some competing theories. Uh, I don't think we have. Um, I've been trying to provide empirical evidence to support the latter idea rather than the former, but uh, these, uh, I think we need more studies, especially from younger populations to really make a strong inference about this. That's great. I look forward to, to seeing that. Yeah, me too. <laughs> All right, um, anyone else have a question? All right, well, if not, um, I would like to thank Hio. And um, once again, thanks so much. So, um, and Hio has, has agreed to stay on for a few more minutes. So if anyone wants to chat with her, I'll leave this um, Zoom room open. And to everyone else, have a great weekend. Thanks so much. And happy to answer any questions afterwards or if